there's a kid's Sunday school song that I haven't been able to get out of my head all week. And it, it goes, uh, be careful little eyes what you see. Be careful little eyes what you see. For the Father up above, he is looking down in love. So be careful little eyes what you see. And it goes on, be careful little hands what you do. And then there's, I don't know if it's the third or fourth verse, but it says, be careful little mouth what you say. For the Father up above, he is looking down in love. Be careful, little mouth, what you say. And that's the way that I titled this message today. And it, this is really what it's all about as we're looking at this section of Ephesians. It's all about the things that we say. And there's an, an, an ad campaign that was going around a few years ago that said, uh, people judge you by the words you use. And then it goes on, you know, to make a powerful impression, you need verbal advantage and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but the truth there is that there is someone who is listening to the words that we say um, and making a judgment on those words. Are they words of healing or are they words of hurting? And as we come to faith in Jesus and trust and reliance on Him, He cleanses us from our sin. He forgives every word that we say, and I'm really thankful for that. But what he also does is he puts his spirit into our hearts. The Bible says that the spirit takes up permanent residence. And then he begins to make changes to our character from the inside out, transforming you into someone who not only thinks like the Lord, but when they speak, they speak like the Lord would speak. And of course, I don't mean they speak in these and thous and thundering judgments or anything like that. But they speak in ways that bring about a healing and a building up of someone. Our problem is that when we come into faith in Jesus, we are, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, we're simply pardoned rebels. And that rebellious heart that we have inside us, it's still really there. I think I used the words baggage before. We bring a lot of baggage with us. It's those character traits that we got from our family of origin, we got from our friends, our uh, workplace, the other people that were influences in our lives, and those patterns, they still pervade our character. And it's why Paul said in Romans chapter 12, don't be conformed to the image of this world. There's a change that's happened. He also wrote to the Corinthians, old things have passed away, behold, all things are becoming new. You are being transformed, and as he said in the prior verses, it's by the renewing of your mind. God is out to change the way you think so that you start thinking like Jesus, which will then influence your character, your words, and your actions. He wants us to, as he said in verse 25 of chapter uh, 4 here, he says he wants us to put away that old way of thinking. And it starts way, way deep on the inside. But that part of us that still patterns itself after the ways of this age and of this uh, world it really also comes from a place deep inside of us, and they are, they are lies that the enemy tells us. And those lies, we begin to believe them, and then they start growing into anger, and that anger eventually comes out in things that we say and things that we do that aren't healthy and aren't good for other people. They are, in fact, words that hurt. Now, as I mentioned last week, Paul is really starting to get practical on us here, and it's going to get more practical with each week. We started out kind of theoretical. He said, walk worthy of the calling with which you have been called. That's live your life like Jesus. Okay, that's all well and good, but how does that really happen in the day-to-day -day world? And he's been getting more specific as time goes on, and today he gets very specific. And he's, uh, last time in verse 28, if you look back at chapter 4, verse 28, he was focusing on our actions. He said, the thief must no longer steal. Instead, he must do honest work with his own hands so that he has something to share with anyone in need. He was talking about embracing, working hard so that we can be a benefit to someone else who has a need. Now today, he's basically saying the same thing. But instead of talking about our actions, he is ta he's talking about the words that we use. And believe me, the words that you use can make a powerful impression on somebody. They usually do. But what is that impression going to be? And that's the question. So let's begin in verse 29. He says, No foul language is to come from your mouth. 
Only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. The word foul here, let no foul language, is used in the Greek to uh, talk about rotten trees bearing rotten fruit. I used to have a pear tree in my backyard and uh, it, it, I still think it's demon possessed. <laughs> because I, I, if you've been around here for a few years, you've heard many a story about this pear tree. Uh, I cut the thing down and it still won't die. <laughs> we were having dinner on our deck last night and looking out and there's this, all these rows, this whole row of things against our back fence and we were realizing, oh, those are little pear trees. <laughs> we cut down one and we've got 15 coming up in their place. But this pear tree, when it was alive, and believe me, those little trees uh, are dead trees walking. They will, they will get their comeuppance today. But when it, when it was a, a, a full-on pear tree, I could never eat the pears because they were always wormy. And I know, you know, you're saying, well, you should have sprayed it and stuff. That's another story. I, I did spray that pear tree one time thinking I sprayed it with fruit tree spray, but it was, um, it was Roundup. <laughs> and, and the most interesting thing happened to my lawn underneath the tree. There was just this circle of death right around the tree. Here I am letting out all my mistakes here. What is wrong? Uh, but anyway, I, the, the point I was trying to make is that I know what getting rotten fruit from a tree is. You know, imagine you see that, and it was a gorgeous tree. Man, it had branches everywhere, tons of fruit. Very, very uh, fruitful tree. And you'd pull a nice, uh, they were um, bosque or something like that, really supposed to be super flavorful and sweet. You'd take one of those pears, and if you were to just take a nice big bite out of it, and you'd take that bite away from your mouth, and you'd look, and there'd be a little worm. <laughs> Well, Paul's making this analogy about a, a tree bearing rotten fruit to us speaking rotten language to other people. I'm not talking about just cussing, although I, uh, that's in view here, but it's really when the, when the words leave your mouth and go into the ears of somebody else, when you pull away, do they see little worms wiggling in those words? And do, does the person come away feeling like they've taken a bite out of a wormy pear? Uh, it also suggests rotten fish. Have you, have you ever taken fish out of the refrigerator and it's rotted or maybe sat on the dock a little too long after you uh, caught it? That rotten fish, that's the taste in your mouth when someone speaks a word that hurts or destroys rather than builds up. So he says, don't do it. Don't let any foul language come out of your mouth. Um, the, word that, uh, the words mean harmful or unwholesome. Don't let any words come out of your mouth that will be unwholesome or could harm somebody else. So the question that we need to ask ourselves before we utter a word is, will my words help that other person or will they harm them? And I'm not just, you'll see as we go through, I'm not just talking about being nicey-nicey and always just, you know, huge smile on your face, God is good, everything is wonderful, or everything is awesome, it's cool to be part of the team, you know. You'll get it if you think about that on the way home. Anyway, we do want to be real, and if you've been around here at any length of time, you know, uh, as the kind of the three-legged stool of this fellowship, is studying verse by verse through God's Word, worshiping God in spirit and in truth, and fellowship, which means a real connection with other people. And that connection means you're real. You are who you are. If you're not doing well, you say, you know, I'm really bummed out. Uh, you know, I gotta admit to you guys, I'm bummed out today, okay? And I've shared it with a few of you guys, and you've been very encouraging, and, and, and you're awesome. Uh, so I'm not talking about just being nicey-nicey. But you have to think about the words that you speak. Is it going to cause somebody's harm in somebody's life, or is it going to cause 
health in somebody's life. Sometimes speaking a difficult word to somebody is the most healthy thing that you can do, okay? So, Paul says that uh, speaking a word of wholesomeness, of building, is like giving grace to someone. And grace is that unmerited favor. So, you have a choice to make. Somebody says something really rotten to you. They say words of hurt. They say words meant to destroy you. But if you, in turn, give them back words of health and words of, of healing, uh, you know, it's just like they don't deserve that. They deserve for you to blast them up one side and down the other. But you make that choice, and it's just like grace. They didn't deserve it, but you gave it anyway. So here are some questions that you can ask yourself before you speak. Will what I'm going to say make me feel better, or will it make them feel better? Will my words make me look good, or will it make them look good? Will my words discourage the person I'm talking to, or will they encourage them to trust in Jesus more? Do my words express anger or love? And finally, will my words be something that I will probably want to take back a little later on? And as I mentioned, sometimes the words that we have to speak are corrective or exhortative. And that's okay. I think the scripture says that a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold. Sometimes the word that you have to speak is, stop this now. That's okay. Because still, is it aimed at helping the other person? Or is it really aimed at giving you something? Sometimes saying a difficult word is one of the hardest things that we can do. But it may be one of the best things that the other person really needs to receive. So he says, don't let any foul language come out of your mouth but only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. And he goes on in verse 30 to say, and don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by Him for the day of redemption. Now this verse is oftentimes taken out of context and basically anything you do that somebody else doesn't like is grieving the Holy Spirit. But I want us to see this this exhortation in the context of the things that we say to one another. It's kind of where I get back to that song, you know, the Be careful little mouth what you say for the Father up above is looking down in love. God is listening. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus said, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will have to account for every careless word they speak. I know, uh-oh, is right. <laughs> God's listening and, and he's got a recording. And, and, you know, unlike the cloud, God's memory is unlimited. Now, I don't say that to judge you. I mean, you know, I'm reading that verse and I'm going, man, I better just not say anything. <laughs> I don't think that's what the Lord has in mind here. But what he wants us to know is the words that you speak can make God sad too. That's what the word grieve there means. It means to make somebody sad. You know the Lord has emotions? In fact, God has stronger emotions than you do. The main difference is God's not a victim of his emotions. They don't take over him. He expresses emotion correctly and rightly, and he wants to teach us how to be able to do that too. And God can feel pain. God can feel great joy. But he can get sad. And when Christians are saying things to one another that hurt and break down, God gets sad too. He says, don't do that because you were sealed by him for the day of redemption. What does that mean? Well, here's one idea that you can think about. The day of redemption, it's also known as the day of the Lord or the day of Christ. You can look up the references to it later or go out to our uh, site, calvarynewberg.org, and I've got the references there in the study notes with this study. But the point is, there's going to come a day when Jesus comes back. 
And when that day comes, he's going to come in the clouds and they're going to get out this incredible, beautiful silver Bach trumpet. I don't know if it's a Bach, but that's a good brand of trumpet. And the, the, the angel's going to blow that trumpet and it's going to blow Al Hurt right out of the water and Maynard Ferguson and all those famous trumpet players. And at that trumpet call, the dead in Christ are going to come back to life. We're going to get our new model bodies. If we're alive, we're going to be instantly changed. Uh, the Bible says that it's in the blink of an eye, which I think is defined as one, uh, one quarter of a blink is a wink. I'm kidding. But anyway, in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, it says, we will be changed. And we're going we're gonna to have eternal life. And we have it now, but we're going to have these, these eternal bodies. And we're going to come back with Jesus to rule this universe. What kind of language, what kind of words do you want to be speaking given the fact that you're going to be in charge of this place with the Lord as being the ultimate one in charge and you represent Him and all of His purity and everything wonderful about Him? We've got to take the long picture into account, the big picture, the long road. I mixed up those two things. <clears throat> this isn't a game. We're being trained. You're going to have a job, and you're going to represent the king of kings. Let's start acting like it now. Let's start thinking and speaking and acting like Jesus now. Otherwise, it's going to be kind of shocking when you have to all of a sudden just leave those things behind. So you've been sealed by him for the day of redemption. Then he goes on in verse 31 to say, All bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting and slander must be removed from you along with all malice. So Paul is talking about the differences then between the foul words that are spoken and what they look like. And then in a moment, he's going to talk about what the wholesome and building up words are. So he says for us to put away uh, or remove from us bitterness, anger, wrath, shouting, slander, and malice. So bitterness means hatred. You hate somebody. You feel hate for them. And malice is then the desire to act on that hatred and to harm another person. They start, these things start in our heads. They start with our thoughts and then they work their way out into our words and then into our actions. And the writer of Hebrews warns us about allowing something called a root of bitterness to take a hold in our minds. A root of bitterness. Somebody does something that hurts you, maybe hurts your pride, maybe knocks you down a few pegs, and you get mad about it and you start harboring that. You start becoming really bitter against that person and if you hold on to that long enough, it is going to work its way out into harmful words or harmful actions. So then he tells us to let these things be removed from our thoughts and words and deeds. And that's a really interesting word there where uh, this word to, to, to be removed uh, slander must be removed. The Greek word there means to bear away that which has been raised up. Okay? The thought that first came to my mind, and I've never done this before, so I probably am going to even explain it incorrectly, but is skeet shooting? Has anybody ever been skeet shooting? Chuck? Okay. A few of you, so don't correct me if I blow it here, but on, on TV and in the movies, you know, they, they say, uh, pull, right? Right, so the guy says, pull, and the skeet goes flying up in the air. It's raised up into the air. And then the person with the gun raises the gun up and blasts the thing out. Or they miss, you know, depending on what, uh, how good they are. But it's like Paul is raising up, and the Holy Spirit raises up these attitudes in our, in our minds and the words that we speak and the things that we do. And then we need to take the Holy Spirit as this rifle and say, all right, I'm going to blow that right out of my character. It's, it's taking away, bearing away something that has been raised up. So our job when those things happen is to pray 
Lord, I realize that you have raised up this issue in my life. I have an anger problem. I have a problem with the words that I speak to other people. They, um, they're, they're harmful. They do harm in other people's lives. They're not building them up. Please, Lord, forgive me for these things. And the Apostle John tells us if we, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is not an issue. God forg has forgiven everything you have ever done, thought, or said. That, don't let that be the issue. But when Paul raises up, or the Lord raises up something, like Paul says here, that you realize you're causing harm, um, say, Lord, would you bear that away? The Holy Spirit is known in the Bible as a paraclete, paracletos, and, and it means literally one who comes alongside to help. So, firstly, the Holy Spirit comes alongside you to help you with your character change by raising these issues and then by even providing healing for you. But you know that idea of a paraclete is not just confined to the Holy Spirit. I, I was reminded of what it says in the book of Ecclesiastes in chapter 4 verse 9 that says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. And over and over again the scriptures encourage us to connect with another believer. That's another part of this idea of fellowship. Uh, the lives become intertwined. That's what the word koinonia means in the Greek. And part of that is to let somebody be accountable to you and for you to be accountable to them. You might not be comfortable talking about issues that the Holy Spirit has raised up, you know, just in public. But perhaps there's a brother or a sister that you can feel comfortable saying, look, I've really got some issues. I need to talk about them. Would you be a paraclete for me and sit down and talk with me about these things? Let me, let me tell you what they are. Help me to walk through these and then help me to be accountable to you. Now sometimes even just a, a, a loving brother and sister might not be enough. Sometimes the issues in our lives are pretty well entrenched because they were uh, traumas that we might have experienced when we were growing up, traumas that we experienced when we were adults. And some people, maybe they just don't have the ability, the training perhaps, to be able to get through to those things. And so I encourage, in cases like that, to seek out a professional uh, counselor who is a Christian, somebody that you can trust, who can just sit there and empathize with you, have the training to be able to help you work through these things. It's all this partnership that takes place. The Holy Spirit is a paraclete, a brother and sister, a professional person that you trust. To get at what is it that's causing my thinking patterns to be this way so that you can see these things freed up. So that you can see your words come out and, and do the things that we're about to look at. Okay, so look at this next verse. This is the goal. He says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another just as God also forgave you in Christ." So three characteristics that Paul highlights, and they are the opposite of what he just mentioned in verse um, 30 here, 31. And they are the character traits of the Lord. This is what it means to think, act, and speak like the Lord. And he wants those character traits to be infected and infused into our lives. And they are, it's kindness, compassion, and forgiveness. So let's look at what these words mean. The word kindness is the, the, the root of, the, of its word is uh, krestos, which means to be useful. So to be kind means to be useful. In your relationships, in your conversations, in your thought life, in your actions, are you being useful or of benefit to one another? That goes right back to what Paul was saying about building up the person, helping them to trust Jesus more, helping them to um, exhibit the character traits of the Lord more. And it's the opposite of anger and malice, which is exacting something on someone or extracting something from them. So kindness. Are the words that I'm using going to be of use to that other person? Secondly, compassion. Um, the Greek word for compassion literally means just to have strong bowels. It meant something to the people who first read this, but it doesn't mean a whole lot to us. But in our day, we would say compassion means to have a tender heart. Are you tender hearted? 
You know, it's actually pretty easy to get testy with another person. They say something that hurts us. They don't perform up to our expectations. They disappoint us in some way. We feel hardened towards them. We get angry. Well, I want to suggest that compassion, instead of letting that anger take hold, compassion says, what is that other person thinking? What led them to do this thing that they were doing? And is there a way that I can help them in their relationship with God and with me to heal that that caused them to do that thing that hurt me? And secondarily, we can also start looking at ourselves and going, why did I react this way to what it is that this person did or said? Is it, as I said, in, uh, I think it was last time, sometimes it's more about us than it really is about the other person. So compassion. And then the third characteristic is forgiveness. You know, you and, you and I, uh, we were no find when the Lord came upon us. It's not like he was going through a barrel of apples and he's, you know, they're all, uh, you know, he goes, wow. You know, when I'm shopping for apples, you know, I, I always look for, I kind of feel them. How crisp are they? Because I hate biting into an apple that's all mushy. Don't you just hate that? Yeah. And so you're looking for the crisp apples. And so we think, you know, oh, the Lord was looking through and he found us. We were a really crisp apple. The Lord says, I want you and my team. You're going to make a really good addition to my, my thing. And that's not the way it was. And in fact, uh, what more likely is the case is that the Lord looked through the bunch of apples and found the rottenest one. The one that when you turn it over, it's all white and mushy and it's like infecting everything around it with all this junk. <laughs> It's like the worst apple in the world. You eat it, you know, you're going to die in the next couple hours. And that's you. And that's me. And he pulled that apple out of the, of the, the, the counter there. And he changed it. To show how powerful he really is. How loving he really is. And that's the same kind of attitude that God wants us to have towards other people. We see the faults in others very clearly. And man, your faults bug me. I'm not saying that about any of us. But you know, in general, that, you know, it just bugs me. And the Lord is saying, you know, think of how I treated you. While we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. Christ didn't die for us when we were just about ready to come to him. He died when we were absolutely in our rebellious hearts. And he forgave us when we were still his enemies. So don't overlook the power of forgiveness when it comes to having conversations with other people. Don't hold on to bitterness, but let it go into forgiveness. And I'm not, again, I'm not saying for everybody just to walk all over us, to never say anything, to never put up any boundaries. That's not what I'm saying at all. But here's what I am saying. Look at every conversation as an opportunity to encourage someone else's walk with Jesus, to disciple them in some way, not high and mighty looking down at your nose, oh, you'll figure it out one of these days when you get like me. Nothing like that at all. Because sometimes it means overlooking a big hurt that somebody else has caused you in order to go around and go, what, where is that coming from? Is there a wound in this person's life that I can help heal? Is there a way I can forgive them and go past this? Because I think a lot of times people... Um, they, they're, when they speak in anger, they're actually speaking out of hurt. And if we can see that, maybe we can get past that anger and go, okay, I can tell something's really bothering you. How can we sit down together and have a conversation about this? Maybe we can see the Lord touch you know, your life and my life. Maybe there are some things that I need to learn here. It's a great way, uh, you know, a kind word turns away wrath. It's really true. Um, so Paul finishes up, and we're going to go just a couple verses into chapter 5, of kind of the overall goal of this, these character traits that he wants us to have. He says, therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children, and walk in love as the Messiah also loved us and gave himself for us a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. So just as God dearly loved you so much that he died for you, we should take that same attitude toward other people. 
It's love. And as I've mentioned before, Ephesians is really all about love. It's agape love. It's other-centered affection. It's finding ways that you can be a blessing to other people. That is the character of God because, as you know, one of the shortest verses in the Bible, God is love. That's what makes up the core of his character, an other-centered affection that is self-sacrificial. Is it easy? No. It is very hard. It's something that you as a Christian will fight with all your life long, okay? So we are not to walk out of here and start berating ourselves because we blow it. Uh, a, a good friend of mine and, and my pastor, uh, Rick Boy at Trail Fellowship, he says this a lot, and I just love it. If God couldn't uh, work with our mistakes, he, couldn't, he would have nothing to work with. You know, he takes us as we are. He helps us to go one step at a time. We stand up, we take a step, we fall, he picks us up. We take another step, we fall, he picks us up. That's the life of a Christian. That's what being an apprentice of Jesus is all about. It's not arriving at perfection tomorrow, but it's walking toward it with the help of the Holy Spirit, with the help of brothers and sisters, and with the help of those that you can um, be with that will help to encourage you. Um, so I would um, encourage you this week to really look for ways that you can encourage other people with the words that you speak. Why, why is this cool? Uh, you know, sometimes we, we say to ourselves, you know, I'm a Christian, I want to do great things for God, you know, and it's got to be something really public, really out there, something that other people are impressed with, you know, and all this kind of stuff. But you know, in the Old Testament, when they would bring sacrifices to the tabernacle or to the temple, and they would throw them onto the altar, and the sizzling meat and the, the aroma of the barbecue would go up into the, into the sky, and, and it was called a sweet-smelling aroma to the Lord. The Lord would smell that sacrifice, and He would go, yes, a picture of the sacrifice of my son is taking place, and this feels really good to me. Did you know you can give that God, you know, as you can make him sad, you can also invite God to a barbecue. And everybody loves the smell of a barbecue. If you don't love the smell of a barbecue, then we got some talking to do. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> and how do you do it? By being kind, compassionate, and forgiving. By finding ways to build other people up with the words that you say. It says right here, Walk in love as the Messiah also loved us and gave himself as a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. The strong suggesting, suggestion is there that as you walk in love, loving others, finding ways to build them up, it is like a fragrant offering to the Lord. And he goes, yeah, not only am I not sad, this is making me glad. Okay, let's stop there. Let's pray. Lord, we realize that you are listening to every word that we speak. And even as your Apostle John said, um, if we say we have no sin, we lie and the truth is not in us. But in fact, we all stumble in many ways. And we want to confess to you, Lord, that we do stumble in this way of words. We get angry, we lash out. <coughs> We feel envy, jealousy. We want things that other people have and we use our words to put them down so that we are built up and they are put down and we feel like we have been more successful. There are lots of ways, Lord, that we use words incorrectly, not in the way that is in concert with your character. And I pray, Lord, that you would bring those things to our mind as you desire to work on them. Help us to be able to um, speak words that are wholesome, that build up, that encourage, that are kind, useful, that are compassionate and empathetic, that are forgiving. Help us to see areas where we can actually help disciple other people to trust you more, even if that's a word of correction, Lord. But help every word we say to be fit, to be good, to be helpful and useful. And just right now, with eyes closed, with heads bowed, I would like to encourage you, if you have never experienced a personal relationship with Jesus, and you don't really know what his character is like at all, you can begin that relationship today, right now. 
Jesus is the most amazing person that ever lived and ever will live. He has the most wonderful character. He's the kind of person that when you hang around him, you don't quite get everything that he says, but you know he's really, really good. And he wants to give that goodness to you. He can make you like him. And all you need to do is to lay down your life before him. To say, I've done things that are wrong and I know it. And I confess those things to you. I've got a wrong way of thinking. But I recognize that you died for this. And that you forgive me. And that you want me to be with you forever. And I want to be with you forever. The Bible says... To confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you'll be saved. Jesus died for you, and God raised him up to prove that his sacrifice on your behalf took. Hang on to that, and you will have eternal life. And you're, uh, you will find your thought patterns changing as you draw closer to him. And so, Lord, we give you our uh, thoughts, we give to you our words, we give to you our actions this week. Help us to be more like you in everything we say, do, and think. In Jesus' name, amen.